so this paper comes from a wider project. Um, I'm working on turning my PhD thesis into a book at the moment, and this is kind of a new, a new chapter of stuff which I didn't get to write about in the thesis. Um, so I'd love to hear uh, your comments on it. It also means that the first half of the paper I will kind of gloss over uh, a lot of the context. So if you do need more evidence and need to discuss it more, I'm very happy uh, to do so. Um, so today I'll discuss connections between Sutton Hoo and poetry in scholarship and pop culture and key features of Sutton Hoo's public narrative and how two creative texts reproduce or subvert these mainstream stories. These texts by Grace Shulman and Mark Fisher and Justin Barthin, they really trouble me and bother me. Um, so I'd love to know what you think. Um, I can see them as forms of temporal spatial excavation into Sutton Hoo, and they register the emotional, imaginative, and sometimes very uncomfortable spaces of the early medieval in the present, and serve as provocation for archeologists interested in the potential for archeology span to serve a public good today. So Sutton Hoo can signify a place, objects, burial events, and excavations. The place is in Suffolk, Southeast England, and has been in the hands of the National Trust since 1998. The burial, now known as Mound One, was opened in 1939, and here in the early 7th century, a stunning array of items, and probably a body, were deposited within a 27 meter ship. Edith Pretty, the landowner who commissioned the dig, donated everything to the British Museum. Further excavations have taken place at Sutton Hoo, revealing a variety of uses from the Neolithic period to the 10th century, but Mound One remains the focus of these public interpretations. In 1939, poetry was quickly used to make sense of Sutton Hoo, especially the old English poem Beowulf, which is found in an 11th century manuscript. Roberta Frank documents how um, Beowulf shed a Scandinavian regal and pagan colour over Sutton Hoo scholarship, even though the objects of Sutton Hoo, she says, belong less to the Beowulf poets' respective Germania than to a European maritime culture that had for centuries imitated Roman ways, and there are Christian and pagan elements in the burial. As in scholarship, in mass media and museums, Beowulf is used to imagine the beliefs and actions of the people of Sutton Hoo. Rupert Bruce Mitford used Beowulf to conjure the Sutton Hoo burial in his 1947 provisional guide, and in TV documentaries featuring Sutton Hoo from the 1960s to the present, passages from Beowulf which introduce the wilderness dwellers, or the Grendel and his mother, are spoken with a booming voice over footage with a moody colour treatment. The emphasis is on paganism, great men, grand ceremony, and dark age monsters. The outbreak of World War II is another repeated feature of Sutton Hoo's public narrative. Journalists and letter writers in 1939 noted the significance to contemporary politics of German remains emerging on English soil. Some used Beowulf and Sutton Hoo to argue for English exceptionalism in the face of difficulty, while others explicitly imagined the past and ongoing supremacy of the so-called Anglo-Saxon race. Since the 1990s, TV presenters, including David Starkey and David Dimbleby, art historian Janina Ramirez, and archaeologists Leslie Webster and Martin Carver, have all stressed the symbolism of 1939, invoking varied ideologies. Sometimes Sutton Hoo is a humanist icon, a reminder that when we fight our neighbor, we're fighting ourselves. At other times, it crystallizes anxiety around past and present threats of invasion, and when and how ethno-racial lines divide the English from everybody else. In popular culture then, Sutton Hoo generates visions of medieval and modern masculine worlds, monsters in the dark, and sometimes nationalism. Um, so Professor Martin Carver has done so much for public understanding of Sutton Hoo, it's almost impossible to untangle his very strategies. But I also want to flag here how Carver finds in poetry a rich language for communicating Sutton Hoo's cultural and economic value and social political functions, which Mark has already touched on a little bit. Um, so Carver describes Sutton Hoo as a theater in which the hopes and fears of a people are given voice. Every burial is a statement and the great ship burial a veritable poem. And this is um, a trope he'll return to in several publications. As Shanks and Pearson show, Carver is not the first or last archeologist to make such analogies. Calling Sutton Hoo a theater and the burial a poem speaks of performance and liveness of proliferating and folding practices practices of interpretation, and these discursive flourishes embrace experiment and ambiguity. However, earlier in the same article, 
Carver explains the project's aims to answer questions that matter to the British people anxious to write something in the earliest pages of the history of their nation. So here literature and archaeology are in the service of a national myth-making project again. At a banal level, these metaphors do encourage emotional and intellectual engagement, but I think they also shape who gets to think of the early medieval English past as their own. So now on to some poetry. Um, the American poet Grace Shulman first published Sutton Who Ship Burial in 1980. So this is before the big Sutton Who research project. Um, and the title announces a direct relationship to the historical Sutton Who, as does the epigraph, which ostensibly is a list of facts, which establishes a sense of authority. Some of these facts are contestable. For instance, calling the person buried in the mound a king kind of domesticates the medieval and creates a very straightforward link between early medieval social structures and modern ideas of monarchy. Others are more complicated than they first appear. So we have Sutton Who on the River Deben near the North Sea, situated within a Germanic world. But we also have the cases in the British Museum with which Shulman indexes Sutton Who as a heritage production, which exists across several times and spaces. So the epigraph orients us in a very complex kind of space time, which is added to by the World War II framing, which immediately comes in the first line. So we have the last warrior, who is an active agent emerging from waters, a medieval volunteer preemptively anticipating the, the evacuation of soldiers at Dunkirk. He's a pseudo Arthurian once and future king emerging at a time of need. Perhaps his bark or his voice serves as an inspiration or a command. And the sea here conceals him, but also preserves. It's a strategic advantage, but also an all too permeable border. So the politics of the poem is elusive and it seems ambivalent about the place of the past in the present, inviting the question, what can a medieval warrior do for us then and now? Something he can do is perhaps offer a sense of comfort even as he is very strange. Um, so this warrior becomes the real Beowulf, a hero, while the Grendels or monsters become manifestations of the heart, suggesting how violence stems from within people uh, and ideology rather than storybook kind of villains. He also looms towards us. Is he a zombie or a folkloric kind of hybrid creature? Um, so he's very uncanny and strange, and how and why he has been watching and waiting in the sea is unclear. But the speaker of the poem is not repelled, but rather they seek some further intimacy. And I think we can read in the acts of listing in the poem as an attempt for this intimacy, an attempt to understand certain whose significance. And this listing reveals the utility and the limits of this kind of enlightenment scientific urge to catalog and, and have everything together. Because as an assemblage, the objects are weird. Um, some are very homely, some are exotic. We have a strange Alrock's horn, the mystery of stars locked in hollows, which contrast with the Christian spoons, which clash with the pagan Celtic willow harp. And all these things we are told are asleep, yet burning to live, reminding us of the more than human agency of objects. The ship, meanwhile, has a very haunting presence and the photographs of the 1939 excavation do indeed reveal the boat as marks in the sand, nail prints, only an impression of solidity. And the ship becomes a resurrection shell, a precious container, which carries kind of obvious Christian connotations. And we can remember how at the beginning of the poem, the warrior rose again out of the sea in a time of need. The shell image is actually repeated later in the poem and it creates a kind of slip between ship and body. So we have the shell as a refuge and the ship as refuge. And then later the speaker hears their own past echoing from within their shell body. And the ship body shell is like the sea. Sometimes it's very homely or a transformative safe cocoon. And other times it's a very mysterious void. And I think this way of thinking about the body um, evokes um, the old English poem, The Seafarer and other old English texts. Um, but in the seafarer, for instance, the body, the hretha lochen, encases the huja, the spirit, the modsefa, the mind, and the hretha, the heart, all of which seem to be synonymous, and all of which break free from the body to, to wander and to fly and to scream. So I think reading Sutton Who with Grace Shulman and with the seafarer, we're encouraged to reflect on where exactly a person goes after death. 
we're shown some strategies for intellectually and emotionally engaging with the past, from meticulous cataloguing to seeking out past peoples, and reminded that meanings shift according to the politics of our gaze. The veneer of certainty that opens up the poem is replaced with a confrontation with the unknown. Um, this, the certain who ship as a shell, as a body, or as a symbol of the Western allies is, in each case, a body that's alienated from itself, manifesting a very strange experience of trying to think across multiple interlocking histories. Um, On Vanishing Land is a sound essay by Mark Fisher and Justin Barton, published in 2013. Um, across 45 minutes and eight chapters, Barton narrates a journey following the River Deben inland from the coast at Felixstowe. And Sutton, who is one of the last landmarks on the walk, Following encounters with Felixstowe docks, Martello Towers, concrete pillboxes, and Bordsey Manor, a former radar station. Barton explains how this whole coast is about fending off incursions from the outside, and so Sutton Who becomes positioned as a kind of watchtower along the way. Sutton Who is first named in Chapter 6 as a place of long hidden relics. And Barton explains how strikingly, when the novelist M.R. James was dreaming up the unearthing of ancient artifacts, he was walking around where the Sutton Hoo ship burial was still hidden. And there's a sense of thrill in treading the same ground as M.R. James. And um, theorists such as Gabriel Moshenska remind us of the dark appeal of the uncanny and public conceptions of, the, of archaeology. And that's clearly at work here. Um, in other essays, Mark Fisher proposed his own readings of M.R. James. And he turns to weird and eerie as specific affects which are adjacent to the uncanny, but I think highlight more of the pleasure that can be found within it. So arriving at certain who, Barton again lists these details of the form and provenance of Mount One objects. As in Shulman's poem, this feels very compulsive but also unsatisfying as he eventually concludes that we don't know their traditions, we don't know whose grave it was, we don't even know if there was a body in the grave. To say that the early medieval world is almost entirely unknown is to exaggerate. There are things that we do know. Um, and the list of what we don't know follows the details of objects. So it seems that there's a pleasure that arises from mystery. And I'm reminded of something else Martin Carver writes um, about his public lectures, where he recalls how some questions and observations return again and again, as though even when answered, they need to live on and be heard once more. But this is for me where On Vanishing Ground becomes quite disturbing. Um, of all of the things to fill the mystery and to fill the void, the narrator turns to sexual assault and murder. <coughs> so Barton wonders whether certain who saw events, such as those recorded by Ahmad ibn Fadlan, the Muslim travel writer who claimed to observe a brutal Rus funeral ceremony in the early 10th century. Now, On Vanishing Land is advertised as an account of the micropolitics of escape, an attempt to dream beyond capitalism. And I think it's a shame that this escape includes vivid descriptions of violence against women. And I think that this is an effect of the emphasis on the pagan and the dark ages in certain who public scholarship and pop culture, that we can turn to this vivid and horrific pagan funeral from 300 years after Mount One's creation in order to fill a gap. Um, in the last year, I've been kind of rereading a series of publications within early medieval literary studies, which I think can help us to unpack what's going on here. Um, I've listed some of them here. Um, and I think they can help us to explore ways of making connections across time and space that resist exclusionary logics, such as ethno-nationalism and sexism. When I was first writing about On Vanishing Land, I was focused on how it drew Sutton Hoo into an anti-capitalist reclamation of Suffolk, claiming the value of place beyond exchange economy. But on further reflection, I'd rather more tentatively suggest that learnings from these scholars can more fruitfully allow us to think through difficulties and tensions in On Vanishing Land and confront how apparently radical politics and poetics can still ingrain a status quo, in this case, damaging myths of the Dark Ages. So we're hopefully all aware of the strained place of the category Anglo-Saxons in the present and the ways in which Grace Shulman's poem and Fisher and Barton's audio essay reproduce exclusionary, one-sided, or even pseudo-archaeological narratives about Sutton Hoo should lead us to query what it is about Sutton Hoo's public story that enables these responses. In many ways, these works magnify the masculinized, violent, and pagan-focused narratives which are communicated in mass media and museums. They reveal how the very fact of Sutton Hoo's 1939 timing and the Suffolk landscape, which bears so many visible markers of war, are tightly woven into public understandings of Sutton Hoo. 
A challenge for those of us interested in changing that narrative will be to confront these very concrete 20th century remains and to interrogate the role of institutions and archaeologists as storytellers. If we're interested in how archaeology can serve the present, we could read these texts as invitations to address kinship across time and seas and reconfigure Sutton Hoo as outward looking, even as it is bounded by rivers, museum cabinets, or surrounded by memories or visible ruins of war. So I think that examining the pleasure found in the strange, the homeliness that exists inside the unhomely can help us to understand and therefore rewrite what the early medieval can do today. I think we need to confront these texts as explicit expressions of desire for and pleasure in the past. And feminist and indigenous medieval um, scholarship can help us to unpack this desire and pleasure and notice how far these affects can stem from anxiety about borders, a longing for a sense of place or a subconscious voyeuristic impulse. So alongside their problems, um, these works model an explicit refusal of understanding the part of capital as a curated heritage product, and they perform an effective excavation into medieval and modern forms of life both at once.